Right, Saturday 3pm football returns to Stamford Bridge where Chelsea Football Club take on Brighton and Hove Albion and this specific fixture is one that if you had have told me growing up would become somewhat of a grudge match, I would never have believed you. Because let's be honest, 10 years ago all that Brighton were really known for was days out at the seaside and the occasional time that you face them in the cup and you start the subs and the kids on your way to a routine victory. But all banter aside, the rise under Tony Bloom has been a meteoric one. And as a sub-consequence of that rise from Brighton and Hove Albion, these lot absolutely hate us. Because let's be honest, Chelsea are Brighton's version of the Love Island bombshell, aren't we? As soon as there is a blossoming relationship, a solid relationship, all eggs are in one basket and a player is really proving themselves and really adding zeros onto their market value, Chelsea come in. We turn their heads and when the market reopens, we are ready to swoop in for the recoupling. Kukurea, Sanchez, Caicedo, Colwell back off loan, even Graham fucking Potter. If you are half decent and you play for Brighton and Hove Albion, we will have you. And therefore Brighton don't like us in the slightest and they would be absolutely buzzing to get a win over us, wouldn't they? And it's a win that will be very, very hard for them to get, not only because of the form that Chelsea are showing at the start to this season, but because of the fact that in three games in last season, which wasn't really a stellar season for Chelsea, we managed to beat them four times. Yes, I am including the 4 free win in pre-season because I'm that petty. And there's good reason for being so petty, and that is because Brighton are a very, very decent side. In Man United's last six fixtures against these lot, they've only managed one win. I think Liverpool have only managed two wins in their last nine fixtures against Brighton and the way they've started the season has been impressive. They've already got a win over Man United, who hasn't, let's be honest. They've taken points off of Arsenal so far this season and they're one of only four teams in the Premier League that are still unbeaten to date. The obvious two, Man City and Arsenal. Brighton are the third and very, very randomly Nottingham Forest are the fourth. And when they lost to Zerbi and appointed Fabian Hertzler, a manager who, by the way, I had never heard of, a manager who is just two years older than myself. That's mad. This fella would have 100% been on Bebo, and now he's managing Brighton Hove Albion. And despite the fact that he had done impressive things in, what was it, the second division of German football, I didn't think it would translate. And four games in, five games in, it still might not translate. But what I'm saying is, in Brighton fashion, they have very much gone against the odds, and they have very much proved why they are held in such high regard. God. But as I have recently found out myself, all good things must come to an end. And this weekend is when Brighton's unbeaten streak in the Premier League comes to an end. Because I've got to just be honest with you. I know you guys probably think that I am an eternal optimist. But I honestly feel like not only is Enzo Maresca marinating something... He's already started cooking it. To be honest, he's serving it up. And what he is serving up is some beautiful transitional football. One of the best counter-attacking teams in European football. And he is showing that he is able to get a level of clinicality. Is that even a word? Whatever it is, he is showing that he is able to get these boys converting more often and more consistently and spread out throughout the team more than Enzo Maresca. Not Enzo Maresca, Mauricio Pochettino was able to at the start of last season. And I know what you're thinking already. You're thinking, Joey... You 
you're getting too gassed up because you've just put five goals past fourth tier opposition on Tuesday night. A match that, by the way, I was at. Big shout out to Jet Set Hospitality who put me up the best in the business when it comes to hospitality tickets. But not only was I at that match, not only was I sinking a few singers and I was having such a fun time because I've been in training for all these fights, which means I can't get up to the bridge as regularly as I would like to. When we speak about the fact that we beat fourth tier opposition, there was a few other Premier League teams that played that night, wasn't there, you know? And when you look at it, the likes of City, Leicester and Villa all eventually came through Leicester. I think it was on penalties, by the way, but they all struggled against lower level opposition. So in the cup, anything can happen. And what you've got to remember is what doesn't mean that much to you means so, so much to these teams. That must have been Barrow's biggest match in 20 odd years or something like that. So it's always difficult to beat any team, no matter the level, as we found out against Savet. And let's have it right. That was just Chelsea's B team, wasn't it, really, that played on Tuesday night? I do say that tongue-in-cheek because our B team, our second-string squad, is absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? And all of the media that wanted to print and spin these negative narratives about, oh, how are you going to keep them all happy? How are you going to fit them in? How are you going to give them minutes? Well, we're doing it, and we're doing it very, very well. And in doing so, it just cements what I say time in time out about the strength and depth that Chelsea have and the fact that it puts us up there with the best in the league and what it means is not only can we be so competitive and be able to field a completely different 11 in these cup games and in these European games and still manage to come away with the results at 45 minutes of a Premier League match if things aren't going your way or even if they're going your way but you see areas that could be better exploited than you have the capability and the personnel on the bench to be able to make those changes and in doing so completely disrupt the dynamic of a game and by the way people I've just realized I got so carried away there in shouting from the rooftops about Chelsea Football Club I forgot to even introduce myself to those of you who are newer watchers of the channel this is the Joey Knight podcast if you like the content at the end of the video if you like it and you want to see more for myself please hit the subscribe button button. Firstly, an apology. The lighting in this room is absolutely shit because I'm on holiday at the moment and I was going to record off of the balcony, but there's a couple of couples trying to chill out next door and they don't want to hear me yapping on today. They can subscribe to the YouTube if they want to do that. You lot definitely do want to hear me yapping on. So can you do me a massive favor right now and smash the like button in this video? I am going to give you lot my starting 11 that I want to see go into this match. And after the game in midweek, it is going to be a little bit of a hard one to pick. And I'm also going to give you a score prediction. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Let's get into it. Right guys, I know exactly what you are thinking right now. This man has had a five round fight of a Golden Gloves winner last night and I hardly look like I've got a mark on me. I am looking well groomed to say the least and that is not because of my defensive ability in a boxing ring. It is because I trust my grooming with Manscaped. And how I do that is by using the Performance Package 5.0. And it's not only me that uses that Performance Package, it is trusted by over 11 million people. So if you want to look as good as me and you want to do so by using the Performance Package 5.0, this is your lucky day because I have a link in my description. If you hit that link, you will get my discount code, which is 20% off. And if that isn't good enough already, you're also going to get free shipping on your order. And firstly, inside the Performance Package 5.0, you will find the Lawnmower 5.0. And this, boys, is your personal groundskeeper for your body. This trimmer comes with two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads, meaning you are going to get the perfect Perfection when it comes to how you are trimmed down there and you are not going to have to worry about any nips or cuts. Not only that, 
it is waterproof, so you will have the power in the shower to be able to trim. Also inside the performance package, you will get the Weed Whacker 2.0, which is your nostril and ear trimmer, because we all know we want to keep those areas trimmed too. We're not done there. We also have two extra free gifts for you, which are the Boxers 2.0 and the Performance Package Bag. So hit the link in the description and use my code JOEYKNIGHT for 20% off and free shipping. Help support me by supporting the guys who support the channel, and that is Manscaped. Thank you very much to Manscaped. Let's get back into the video. Now, if you look at the lineup and you look at the bench and you look at who actually got on the pitch against Barrow through the week, you will see there were key names like Noni Madueke, like Ku Carrera, like Enzo Fernandez, Fafana, Cole Palmer, all of which made either not an appearance or didn't even manage to get on the bench. And that would heavily suggest that they were being rested for this match. And then that might give you some sort of interpretation as to how Enzo Maresca is going to go with his team. But I've always said it when I pick my teams, this is not my predicted lineup. This is my preferred lineup. And when you look at how well we played in that game in the Cup, it has given me a headache as to whether some players have done enough there to give a real justified shout as to why they should be starting in this game. But... At the same time as saying that, I do also believe, believe that continuity is such a massive thing in football. And Maresca is really developing a spine and a core that works at the moment. So with that in mind, here is my starting eleven. Now, I know what you're thinking here. Straight off the back, Stevie Wonder could have taken a look at that graphic and still been able to name you the starting eleven that I've just picked. But I do believe that continuity is a real important thing. And do you know what? You could look at Jose Mourinho's starting 11s for Chelsea during his seasons where he won the league. And you could have pretty much for 90 to 95% of the time picked the starting 11 without seeing it. Same goes for Ancelotti. Same goes for Conte. Same goes for Tuchel. So having that spine and having that team that you can pick with your eyes closed isn't a bad thing. There's a reason you can do it. And that is because they are playing well together. So having these established names in the starting 11 isn't a bad thing for me. It's more a balancing act of being able to give the minutes and keep the big names happy that aren't in the starting 11. But so far, so good when it comes to the handling that Enzo Maresca has shown with it. Now, let's look at the team itself. Robert Sanchez, I understand that Jorgensen played well on Tuesday. He played well every time he's been in the team so far. But Robert Sanchez is the player that I'm saying time in, time out now, may well be on his way to a redemption arc here. Two clean sheets in a row, played really well against Palace as well, a game where he didn't get a clean sheet in that fixture. And his distribution from the back was something that I thought was somewhat of a myth in the past. Well, now it's coming to fruition. So I'm going to see him stick in there, and I think he actually might get another clean sheet here. Now, Melo Gusto, he only got 45 minutes um, through the week, in which was actually clever because look if we can give him 60 minutes here I wouldn't be adverse at all to seeing someone else come off the bench and maybe we slightly readjust the positioning of this team now Chilwell came off the bench from the other night I wouldn't be against it. I wouldn't be against it. If I had my pick, though, it would be tossing Adarabayo that comes off the bench. Then we'd see Fafana move slightly over into the right-sided centre-back position. Tossing, I actually think, is best in the middle. And then Levi Colwell, and you know Kukure is going to be inverting. Now, Enzo Fernandez. I have been somewhat critical at times of Enzo Fernandez. And once Lavia does come back into this team, we're hearing it could be as soon as this match. But with, what, six weeks on the sidelines, I don't think we want to rush him back too much. In fact, I think it was more like eight weeks because there was the international break. We don't want to rush him back when we look at at the injury history that he has had. And do you know what? Enzo Fernandez did actually really impress me against West Ham. I thought he was assured, composed. He knocked the ball about well, which was what we know that he always does. But what he did best, which impressed me the most, was he actually put a solid defensive shift in. And I do believe that that is something that we need. Now, when we speak about players that can put a solid defensive shift in, we need to speak about more. Is this Caicedo? Because this man 
is showing his worth so, so much. We just touched on Enzo Fernandez. We, as the Chelsea fan base, really, really hope that he manages to, at some point, live up to the price tag that we paid for him. I'd say Caicedo's already lived up to him. I'd say Caicedo has already lived up to that price tag. Caicedo is a top three central defensive midfielder in the Premier League. And do you know what? Rodri's out for the season, so he's a top two. And do you know what? Is Rice still serving a match ban? Red card, think he is. He's top one. Moises Caicedo, best central defensive midfielder that the Premier League has ever seen. You can clip that one up. Um, I think he's absolutely brilliant at the moment. I think in the first season, there was a lot of people that wanted to critique Moises Caicedo and they wanted to jump on him because of the price tag, but he just puts in good performance after good performance. And you know what? In a player of that position, he might miss the odd tackle, but that's because he's going for 10 to 20 times more tackles than everyone else on the pitch per match. The boy is magic. Not only can he defend, you know, there was a name, the McAlealy role, right? It was named after Claude McAlealy because he was brilliant at intercepting, cutting the ball out, tackling, passing it on to the more skillful players who were able to then thread a ball through. Well, I'm not going to say he's as good as McAlealy, but Caicedo can do all of that, but he doesn't even need to pass it on to the more skillful players. He can be the one to get the assist. We saw it time in, time out. We saw it last season against Nottingham Forest late. We saw it the other day, didn't we? Against West Ham. I forgot about that one. Caicedo is the absolute bollocks. Now, let's look at the forward line in front of them, right? Madawaki. So, there was a fair bit made of the fact that Madawaki didn't pass against West Ham. Do you remember? We went through on goals. It was giving everyone PTSD of Raheem Sterling vibes when he did it against Wolves and when he did it against Villa and when he did it against Palace. The list goes on. He used to do it a lot, Sterling. He's a very selfish player, but Big up to him. He's he's all right. He's all right. But the numbers don't lie, my friends. And the numbers would tell you that four goals and four assists in five starts so far this season for Chelsea is pretty good. First call up for England as well during that time. How'd he do in that one? Didn't watch it. Do you not know? Joking. I did watch it. He got an assist on his debut for Harry Kane. Noni Madueke is Maresca's dream. He is a man that can take on men. He can do it at speed as well. Take men out the game, create opportunities for us. And I really do think that this is the season where not only the league, but world football really wake up to just what a player Noni Madueke is. And do you know what? He's an intelligent footballer. And do you know how you know he's intelligent? He left Spurs. Cole Palmer as the centre attacking midfielder. So far, Cole Palmer's numbers have been brilliant. Some of his performances have been brilliant, but he's not even started to hit the heights yet. So my God, if this is how it starts, just think how good it's going to get for him. Now, Jaden Sancho on the other side. And this was a position that I really had to think about, you know, because Pedro Neto is not only a great player, but his pace is a Electric, And not only does he have it, much like Mikhailo Mudrik, but unlike Mikhailo Mudrik, who people are going to dig me out for saying this now because he had a good game against Barrow, but unlike Mikhailo Mudrik, in my opinion, he knows how to use it, you know, so... I don't think that Brighton are going to come and park the bus against us. I think that they've shown already in their start to the season that Brighton know how to grind out results. They know how to get wins and they do come to attack teams. So I think that any team that doesn't park the bus and does try and win a game against us is ultimately going to leave space in behind. And when you look at Veltman, who it would probably be up against Pedro Neto, you can see him running in behind. You can really see him exploiting that space. But... As much as I wouldn't dispute starting Pedro Neto and maybe bringing on Jadon Sancho, who is a player in the second half, if the game's not going our way or if we need to break down a team that are now looking to defend and play that low block, it could be a positive thing. It could be a good thing to do that. I just want to see Sancho from the start, man, because I have been so, so impressed by what I've seen from him so far. And you know what? You lot are going to think I'm mad. And I will get pelters in the comments for this, but I'm going to be honest because I do keep it honest on this channel. You know, when we were first linked with Jaden Sancho, I didn't even really want him. I didn't even really want him. I, I, I knew he was a good player, but I wasn't even that bothered. We had signed so many players that I wasn't even that bothered. And I was thinking of Neto as a left winger. Now we're sort of seeing that he plays just as well off of the right wing. And I do believe that out of sight is out 
of mind. And I think the fact that he had been exiled by Eric Ten Hag made me sort of think, ah, oh, do we need him? Do we need him? Well, he's had two games for us, and the answer is yes, we do need him because he's fucking brilliant, Jaden Sancho. I think he's settling in to life at Chelsea so, so well. And do you know what this transfer has shown you more than anything? And that is that Eric Ten Hag knows nothing about football, if I'm being completely honest. And Jadon Sancho knows everything. Jadon Sancho is omnipresent because he sees it all. And in this game, he is going to see Nicholas Jackson running in behind. He's going to feed him and Jackson's going to score like he did against West Ham. Now, when you see Nicholas Jackson up top there, right, a lot of you lot straight away are going to say to me, hold on, are you for real? Nkunku has just scored a hat-trick and you're starting Nicholas Jackson. And the Nicholas Jackson Christopher and Kunku debate is one that will rage on all season, and I'm very happy it will because that is because both of those guys will be doing well. There'll be twists, there'll be turns, but here is how I see it, right? Jackson, despite Nkunku's midweek hat trick, is just more of a natural number nine than Nkunku, you know. I don't believe that Nicholas Jackson could do the things that Christopher Nkunku could do, maybe out on the wing or in the 10 role. I think that Christopher Nkunku may, may be the better player, but the better number nine out of the two of them by absolutely no shadow of a doubt, in my opinion, is Nicholas Jackson. I think his ability last season went so far under the radar. I think this season, there'll still be those so, you know, called accounts that want to make memes and whatnot. And he'll miss a few sitters. He'll score a few brilliant goals that then get VAR'd for offside. But what you have got is a raw talent and enigma. And in Nicholas Jackson, I'm telling you now, Come the end of the season, he will be regarded as one of the top three number nines in the Premier League. He's going to get into double digits for goals this season. I genuinely do think that this is the player in our squad which probably has shown the most improvement since joining Chelsea Football Club. And when you think about the squad that has Cole Palmer in it, Noni Madueke in it, Melo Gusto in it, Caicedo, so many players who have really upped the levels, that really is saying something. Now listen, love Christopher Nkunku, by the way, love all the boys on the bench, but with the strength in depth we have, some players will need to miss out. There's only 11 able to be on the football pitch, unless you ask Todd Bowley, he thinks you can have 12 on there apparently, but either way, don't shoot the messenger. Let me know your thoughts, people. I want to know your thoughts on that starting lineup. I want to know whether you would change different bits and pieces in there. I think the Jackson and Kunku debate is a good one. So you let me know what you think in the comment section below. Now, listen, Brighton made it tough for Arsenal. They beat Man United and no one has taken maximum points from Brighton so far. But at the bridge... We will. We are going to make it the hat-trick, ladies and gentlemen. And not just the hat-trick of Premier League wins. We're going to make it the hat-trick of Robert Sanchez clean sheets. I am going to go for a 2-0 win in this game. So let me know your thoughts. Give me your score predictions in the comments section below. And I will see you all in the next one.